Hello, everyone, and welcome to Blogging Theology. Today, I am delighted to talk to Peter O'Born. You are most welcome, sir. Um, well, it's a real pleasure to, to, to speak to you. Just for those who don't know, Peter is an award-winning writer, journalist, and broadcaster who has worked for various newspapers, including The Spectator, The Daily Mail, and The Daily Telegraph, where he was the chief political commentator until his resignation from the paper in 2015. He now writes for The Middle East Eye. Google that. You can see it's an online journal, The Middle East Eye. He is the author of numerous books, including the Sunday Times bestseller, The Assault on Truth, published just last year. Now, his new book, just published, hot off the press, is this. There we go. The Fate of Abraham. Why the West is Wrong About Islam. Amazing titles. Why the West is Wrong About Islam. Now, I'll link to this in the description below. Um, I've read a lot of it and uh, it's actually extremely readable, not surprising from a, a top journalist, but very informative as well about the history of the relationships between the West and Islam and contemporary issues as well. So, Peter, would you like to explain why you felt the need to write this book? Absolutely. And thank you for asking me on. I, I um, do you know it's taken me nearly 20 years to research and write this book. Wow. Find ways of writing it and thinking about it. And if you, uh, you know, I, and it is some people have questions why I write it. Well, I'm, a, I'm an Anglican Christian. Um, and I'm, um, and I was, uh, when I first conceived the idea of this, uh, the political correspondence of the Spectator magazine, it's a very conservative magazine. It is. Fashion conservatism, really. Um, believe. And I, I um, it was just around the time of the Iraq War and the, its aftermath, I was so upset by the, by the Iraq War and the lies that had been told by the British state uh, about the weapons of mass destruction and then the way in which it was reported. And, the, and then I noticed in Britain the way in which Muslims were being reported. Mm. And I, I, I uh, believe in fairness, decency, and actually I think the ultimate British value is sticking up for the underdog. Ah, yes. And I watched a way in which Muslims were being uh, being reported, and I saw them coming, not really reported, just simply attacked, the fabrication of lies, mm. um, smears, uh, almost every day. Um, and so I, I remember I said to myself, I'm going to actually find out the truth about these, these stories about Muslims. I mean, they're really awful things, you know, spreading disease, wanting to ban Christmas, attacking British institutions. I mean, um, I, saw, I, I remember I went up to Manchester. to. I, I saw a story, front page of The Sun and all over the ITN News, BBC, about some Muslim who wanted to blow up Manchester United, a group of them. And I got up there. It, and it was a blow at match United on match day, and it was it was a complete fabrication. But I also managed to get to meet one of the people who the suspects, um, and what and the, it was clear a that the police had leaked stuff to the Sun because uh, it had details like he had the ticket for the match. He was a Manchester United supporter. Was, you know, he come from he was a, he was a refugee from Saddam Hussein's. You know, he was a Kurdish refugee from Saddam Hussein. Yeah. And, he, and he was such a, and he obviously really meant a lot to go to the ground. And it's now being twisted by the mass media in Britain to make out that he's a terrorist. And he was, he did, he spoke anonymously and he was, he was suffering from pretty well post traumatic stress disorder from having gone through this. So I did speak to him anonymously. And I said to him at the end, I just feel so ashamed to be British, that you've come to this country as a refugee from Saddam Hussein and you've been treated like this. Mm -hmm. And it's gone on, and this is a, a, this situation, this kind of fabrication of misdeeds by Muslims is become a perennial and structural feature of the, 
of the British media political establishment. Mm. I deal, uh, in, and you see, you've, you know, with, with other cases, the Trojan horse fabrication, the, 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 the creation of a twisted narrative about grooming gangs. I don't say there is mm. awful crimes being committed by Muslim men that have, but the way that was um, twisted into something much more, it, going deeper into a sort of ancient lie dating back to the Middle Ages mm. uh, about the kind of rape of w white women. It was very terrible what has happened. And actually, a ghastly event in uh, Buffalo uh, uh, this week, last weekend. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it, the, the, that, that you can see the reverberations of that fabrication, that mm. twisted use of what was a terrible thing which happened, but it was mis it was way it was turned into a, a kind of attack on a community. And so I, 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 just, I started to keep a record of this and then I started to work out why it was happening. And I could, you can track a collaboration between the, the mass media and the political class. You could show the role of think tanks mm. in creating a new discourse about about Muslims, and actually, I and I and I spent. I went. I've been all, all, all around Britain. I've spent, uh, you know, talking to you know community leaders, to ordinary Muslims. Actually, to ordinary white Britons who don't like Muslims, you know, and and, and often they're very decent people. They're really decent people, but who feel that they're under threat. But they, they, it's because it tends to be because they're fed a diet of yeah. Um, nonsense, but the pernicious nonsense. Um, and so, and then I, I, I worked out, I, I started then to look at the more, how has this come about? And you can, I did some forensic reporting into the, the people who generate these stories and how they get generated, how politicians use them. Um, and uh, and then I look at, go in the his, into the history of how you know the modern uh, kind of uh, rhetorical war on Islam. You can trace it all the way back to the Middle Ages to mm -hmm. Pope Urban the Second at Clermont when he launched the the Crusades in the 11th century of uh, the Common Era, and uh, that, that, that's uh, what I and, and you can see that there is a kind of collaboration almost, it's too strong a word, but a common understanding between the neoconservatives on the one hand in the, who come out of the United States uh, and see some form of clash of civilizations between Islam and the West and organizations like ISIS and Al-Qaeda who, who, who share the same narrative that Islam is a bloodthirsty religion and that there is a clash of values and, uh, and it and everybody in between is sort of cut out of this, um, cut out of the debate in many ways. And so this is a time, to, this is an attempt to recover the middle ground, I think. Mm. Mm. Okay, but, that, that, that's fascinating. I do, I do um, as I say, recommend uh, for, for people to read the, the full story uh, to get Peter's uh, book, which I link to below. But if, if we could, um, for, for, for this conversation, focus just on one part of the book, part four. Uh, of your book. And this is entitled The Enemy Within. And you write about what you call the Cold War on Islam as very strong language uh, and arguably justifiable in the light of the evidences that you uh, discuss. Could you explain what you mean by this? What is this? Who is the enemy within? And what is this Cold War on, on Islam? Yes, well, what I show is um, this is the, probably the most original part of the book because it's based on my own research, my own experience as a journalist, mm. a, a conservative political journalist in Westminster mm. um, in the, you know, in the early, in the noughties, you know, and, and um, beyond. Um, after, after 9-11 and the, also the London bombings, but, uh, the, but particularly after 9-11 attack on the Twin Towers, you, you got a, uh, a, the theoreticians, the security experts, um, said, what are we going to do about the, the, the threat of Islam? 
uh, and they were this was this was the Bush administration, which was whereas George W. Bush hadn't got a great deal of uh, didn't have a worldview really, but the people around him were the were he he had surrounded himself with Dick Cheney, Wolfowitz, the the the, the, the neo the neocons. They had a very strong ideological belief yeah. that Islam presented a real and present threat to the West. Mm. And they started to well, ask themselves how to shape, uh, sh shape the narrative about Muslims and create the structures with which to deal with it. And they went back to the, uh, a, 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 as an inspiration and as a model, they looked at the way in which the um, United States and its allies, above all Britain probably, had fought the uh, Soviet, the menace of Soviet Union mm. uh, in the Cold War, uh, which very swiftly developed at the end of um, uh, after 1945 and the defeat of and the defeat of fascism. Mm -hmm. And it was a kind of um, it was they 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 surveyed the world and they said there are good. The, we understand, we, how do we isolate the communists or the leftists? Yeah. And there was a variety uh, of mechanisms, uh, but a lot of it was secret. So they would set up secret organizations to, uh, which appeared to be open, you know, magazines or mm. civil society organizations, um, uh, but, but were really funded by the uh, CIA. Yeah. yeah. Um, in Britain, we set up something called the um, Information Research Department, which is a completely secret Whitehall department. It was the Atlee government, a, a socialist government, really, um, which set it up, but it was very pro-American. And the view was that the, the threat posed by Soviet Russia, Soviet communism, was so grave that any means really, including secret means, were totally legitimate in order to fight the Soviet threat. And actually, I, I'm not, I can certainly see that that was a perfectly reasonable argument. I mean, the, the Soviet Union did pose a terrible threat to the, to the liberties of the world. It was a monstrous uh, system in many, in many ways. Uh, but it did, it, it did, it felt that the threat was so great that it were franchised to Produce loads of secret material, which manifest pretended to be what it was, and it pretended to be, emerge from real journalists operating uh, or re, uh, or real politicians. But actually, it was approved people, sanctioned and issued with material. Um, and, and, and this is this has come out subsequently. Now, this is not a conspiracy theory, or there was a conspiracy, of course. Uh, but the CIA did find a vast array of intellectuals and politicians and journals. Some of them very distinguished uh, left-wing journals, but anti-Soviet, anti-communist, but left-wing journals um, uh, uh, for, for years. And this, this caused huge embarrassment to the left, particularly when uh, this was actually admitted and uncovered uh, quite openly by in the States. This is no longer a secret. And, and your point, of course, is that by analogy, this is something that is now happening um, to, to Muslims uh, in terms of the Western propaganda. So they said that what we've got to do now is to go back to the lessons of the Cold War, because we, we're not fighting a Cold War against Soviet Russia. Mm. We're not fighting a, a Cold War against Islam. Mm. And so, um, and you can, <laughs> I do set out in this chapter how uh, they reinvented the Information Research Department and, and used many of the same sort of techniques um, you know, fake organizations, government sponsored organizations. Right. Um, some of it's in the open. I mean, you do can trace in quite a few organizations, government home office funding. Some of it is completely clandestine. And, and there's, a, there's a term used for it actually astroturfing, a civil society where we all celebrate. We have a very rich civil society in Britain. It's mm. something we all celebrate but organizations which actually are not what they appear to be, they're funded mm. by um, some, you know, some home office related group. And so they're not quite sure who you're dealing with. And the view, mm. the argument used, again, I fully understand it, is that there's a terrible existential threat uh, to the West from Islam or what they tend to call Islamism. And therefore, um, 
the state is justified in its ultimate vindication or the ultimate reason for the existence of any state is the securing the security of its citizens. And this is part of a virtuous uh, thing, a virtuous policy. Hmm. Uh, I argue in this book, and I really uh, I argue in this book that yes, there was a real threat from Soviet communism to the way of life of the West. In the case of Islam, not a single Muslim country has ever declared war on the West or been at war um, with the West, and. Um, I think that they misunderstood the nature of the threat. Yes, there is a threat from Al Qaeda, ISIS, very uh, which must be fought by the state. I fully support that. But by what the trouble with this analysis is that you are criminalizing or putting under surveillance and suspicion vast, large tracts of of of, Mus of Muslim society, large parts of the community. And mm -hmm. that, I think, is good. And they, these are our fellow citizens. These are our fellow Britons. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't think this policy has been um, uh, we, is widely enough and understood. I also think it's the wrong policy. I think that we should engage with our fellow, our fellow citizens have this, exactly the same rights as we do. Yeah. OK. Can I just quote a, a passage from um, your book, um, page 258-259, which... Um, this is in the, the section, part four, uh, The Enemy Within. And, and you write, uh, this is apropos what you've just said, really, an officially approved discourse about Islam was constructed within Whitehall. Whitehall is where the British government is based in, in London here. Muslims were divided between moderates and extremists, two deceptively simple and easy to understand words which have been used against Muslims to devastating effect. So-called moderate voices, which amplified the government-approved message, received funding and often access to mainstream media, above all the BBC. Those who challenged the official narrative were denied such access. Front organisations were created to promote government-approved doctrines. This is back to your analogy with the, the Cold War. And then you go on, and, and this is, if I may, the next part of our discussion at the heart of these political strategies was prevent P R E V E N T with a capital P the counter extremism program introduced by Tony Blair's government in 2003 prevent was given a budget of hundreds of millions of pounds a vast treasure trove a whole range of apparently grassroots Muslim organizations meanwhile were funded by prevent to prevent the government, so to promote the government's narrative on terrorism. Um, and you say over the years, Prevent Program has come to serve as a backdrop against which a Cold War on British Islam has been waged. Mm. Now, this, this organization, Prevent, is very interesting and hugely controversial. And it's flared up in the news again recently with Cameron, the former prime minister, coming out to defend this uh, organization and its agenda against accusations of Islamophobia and other people saying, no, it is Islamophobic. It's, it's surveying Muslims. It's asking them to conform to this nebulous concept of British values, which is like the rule of law, as if that was a British value. I think most societies would agree on the rule of law. Um, but anyway, it, it's, it's, it's specifically uh, targeting uh, Muslims and putting them under suspicion and under surveillance and so on. Could you just talk more about the Prevent program and, and your views on that uh, in the ongoing, uh, what you call the, the Cold War on, on Islam? Yeah, I, I mean, the Prevent program now does not specifically, or that is to say, only target Muslims. It does mm. target the far right as well. Mm. And uh, anybody else who it considers is on, the, on, on some journey towards potential terrorism, the, the reason I criticise the PREVENT program mm. um, is, uh, and, it, and also actually you're completely right, but this is a critical moment. We're, await we're, going, we're having this review of PREVENT, which is now delayed, but it's ca being carried out by William Shawcross. Um, who is? Who is a... <laughs> he's 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 a I know him quite well. He's a former biographer of the Queen Mother, but perhaps more as significantly of Rupert Murdoch, the oh. uh, owner of the Times newspaper and the Sun. 
Um, and he's very uh, close to the sort of Boris Johnson lot, um, which is why they gave it to him. And he, he's on record with a number of views about Islam or, uh, and the many as it provides to the West, which I think give cause to people to mm. worry whether or not he is the right person because he has comes he comes into this role of reviewing prevent with baggage mm. and he is one of the things which um one of the re uh, i think the prevent is very poorly understood first mm. of all okay it's only one part of contest which is the broader counterterrorism strategy and again most of that strategy we all agree that the state has a duty to, 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 to do everything it can to stop, to protect our, 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 the, the, its citizens. And so absolutely, the, you know, we need the, lots of elements of the contest strategy. There's one of them is, is protecting public buildings and public figures, make sure that you can't get at them with a bomb or a gun. Yeah. Of course, well, one of it is, part of it is how to handle a crisis when it actually occurs and make sure uh, it's it, it, it's 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 minimised. Another one is the classic intelligence work. It's I think they call it pursue, where you go after you know you 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 you're, you're it's, it's it's you're looking for potential terrorists, the plotters. You're you're trying to, to use the usual techniques of, of policing and, and intelligence to stop that. Th th those three elements are completely right. The question with prevent is that it is not about terrorism, actually. And, and one of the problems of the language uh, used by uh, politicians is it often suggests that it is. They, it's about something they call extremism. Yes. Now, extremism. And, and contrasted with moderate or mo um, um, yes. so there's a juxtaposition between good, I would argue, good and bad Muslim. A good Muslim is a moderate Muslim. A bad Muslim is an extremist Muslim. But these are very nebulous, vague terms. I, I don't get the sense they've been very precisely defined uh, in law or linguistically or semantically in any way. And so it's kind of a very catch all phrase. Oh, you have an illiberal opinion a non-liberal opinion, therefore you are an extremist and potentially dangerous and therefore a candidate for a prevent programme uh, interest. Yes, if you look at the way pro prevent operates, it does target people's religious opinions. In fact, part of the whole kind of way it's explained to people who have to work with the prevent programme is somebody gets a bit keen, gets a bit more religious. That's a potential warning trigger sign. Yeah, like getting a, you mentioned the book, having a beard, for example. <laughs> well, yeah. and, and you mentioned it actually uh, under the McCarthy. You you could, you're, you're comparing it with the previous. <laughs> the Jack, I said uh, so that, danger signs in both eras. Yeah. Under communism, that's having a beard, and under having a beard, communism, oh, it's yeah. having. You, you showing you know changes in dress is what yeah. is one of the things sudden or changes suddenly getting very keen on religion or getting agitated about political issues i.e um, you know palestine is the great one at the moment and I, to me it's completely natural that a young muslim would get agitated and want to campaign uh, on behalf of the palestinians uh, and to turn that into in fact i think that's healthy political engagement and you and i are of an age <laughs> We remember, I remember when I was at school, the anti-Vietnam demonstrations. I think that's part of growing up is getting involved. And if you see an injustice, you want to fight that injustice or struggle against it. And suddenly you're, you, there's lots of examples of the prevent strategy being, being, being aimed at people, you know, people agitating or worried on behalf of Palestine. And that is seen under the... This rather curious ideology, really. It's radicalization theory invented by academics, very contested. That the more sort of um, the, there's a pathway called uh, from moderation, this blessed state <laughs> of moderation, to this very dangerous state of radicalization, um, and uh, that involve that can involve changes of behaviour. Going to you know, getting more religious, getting more grievance. Grievance is a word. Having grievances, well, a grievance, and um, and that of course, and it is important to state that this is not just about Muslims. It's also about the far right, but um, and other 
people, but I certainly, but the all the evidence suggests that a, a, an awful lot of it is aimed at Muslims, and whether it, I, I, I and in many ways it, it it's very hard to see how it's not an attack on free speech and opinion. Mm-hmm. You're criminalising or apologising is another oh, phrase. Yeah. Yeah. A, 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 a opinion and, a, and a, these are the problems which it's faced yeah. and the question and I completely accept it needs to be reviewed and the government was right to do that but put Willie Shawcross in charge of the review is he going to listen in a sensible way to the very legitimate serious criticisms of the intellectual basis of prevent and the way it's being practiced or is he going actually to do something else with it, which is take it to a new level. Well, well, I'm going to suggest here, you should be the guy who reviews this. You should be, the government should be appointing you to do this job <laughs> and, and not the uh, biographer of the Queen Mother, I would suggest. It might be a more appropriate... Oh, there but, are good biographers of the Queen Mother. Biography. Oh, I'm sure it's a, a terribly uh, fascinating and laudable biography of the Queen Mother, yeah. Um, and uh, sorry, I just want to say that there, there was a, a clip circulating on social media, which I also circulated when I heard it, uh, of an actual interview <clears throat> by a prevent police officer of a young Muslim lady, I think it was. Uh, and he was interrogating her about her unacceptable views. Uh, see, Muslims have usually have socially conservative views on sexuality, particularly a homosexuality, you know, the usual things. And, and this young Muslim woman had shown, uh, uh, unfortunately, that she uh, subscribed to the socially conservative Muslim views that people have as taught by the religion. And the police was actually um, questioning this and suggesting that this was incompatible with being British. And uh, it was it was totally shocking. And so this was circulated by, um, I forget, there's an organisation that keeps an eye, an eye on Prevent. Um, is it possibly called Preventing Prevent or something yeah, like that? Something like, yeah. I heard the same clip and it is disturbing yeah. because really what that was is an attack on religious liberty. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we live in it, and it's very unconservative, by the way. I, one of the things which... Uh, my beloved um, friends in the Conservative Party uh, all do. They, they're always telling us that the philosopher king of conservatism is a character called Edmund Burke, mm. a very Irishman from the 18th century who, was, yes. who, 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 who's, who, who argued passionately for religious toleration. Over against the French Revolution, because he wrote the famous Reflections on the yeah, Revolution indeed. of France. And he, he, he was appalled by the reign of terror, this politically correct reign of, of a conformity to a certain narrow vision of life, secularism, atheism. Very, and he was saying, no, we, we, we in England, we, we have liberty of conscience, freedom of conscience. So I can see where you're, you're, you're not a, a neocon uh, fan, clearly. Uh, you're, you're, you're a much more ancient pedigree going back to uh, people like him. Is, and I think that the... The, the prevent strategy and the is a manifestation of a an analysis uh, which is something which one might call I've come I'm not the inventor of this phrase I like it very much is we're not talking about conservatism anymore even though it is the policy of a conservative government right. we're talking about a kind of coercive liberalism or muscular liberal because uh, Cameron oh, yeah. the former prime minister actually called it we know you know muscular uh, liberalism, in other words, to bash the, the Muslims. Who and it's almost like a new religion in a way, because it's yeah. telling you what you've got to think. Yes. And it's secular. It's, it's imposing secularism as a kind of state religion. And it's not simply aimed, by the way, it's important to say this, uh, at Muslims. It's aimed at uh, any faith which has the audacity to the differ from the consensus of 2022, the year we happen to be living in. So Orthodox Jews are very much uh, subject to this kind of constraint. And, yeah. uh, and so would uh, Christians. Yeah. I think there's a, I do notice though, I, and I'm not, it's not my, I'm not a member of the Catholic church, but you know, the, in, the, in Catholicism, they won't have women priests. They won't mention that. They won't go after that. They're not, and I think even though that is a gross dereliction of duty in the world of coercive liberalism is not to allow women priests to one of the great, <laughs> but they don't do that because they don't want to upset the po- Catholic population. And quite I rightly so. I, I, it's up to the Catholic church, I think, not to, you know, to, to manage its own affairs. And that is, and it reports to, not to any um, 
any, um, how should one say, a, a, any worldly power. It reports to, um, you know, the Pope is, is responsible to, only to, to God, as, as my understanding. And I, and that is, it is, it is not, it is, it is, it is above or beyond borders. Well, I'm, so what we are seeing is a generalized attack mm, on mm. religious liberty. And this is one yeah, manifestation yeah. of okay. it. Yeah, there's an organisation called Christian Concern, a uh, UK-based evangelical group, which is actually very, in my opinion, very Islamophobic. But on this point that you're, you're making, uh, they do stand up for the rights of Christians who have been arrested and prosecuted in the UK for simply holding mainstream biblical beliefs on sexuality, for example. And there's some terrible cases where doctors recently have been, uh, pros- uh, have been prosecuted or fired for holding views on transgender issues, uh, which don't conform to the latest woke ideology. And, and they, Christian Concern, have stuck up for these people. So you're right. Uh, it, it, the pe- people who are getting it in the neck are not just Muslims. It, it's conservative Christians, or Orthodox Jews, as, as you rightly say. And even cons- there, there are even conservative atheists, uh, uh, I believe, uh, around as well, who uh, have been um, criticised um, publicly as well. So this is a problem. But I think I, I get the, the sense in your, in your book, uh, which I do recommend, the... Uh, the fate of Abraham, why the West is wrong about Islam, that Muslims are the, the main predominant target uh, on, every, on every level, ideological, security, military, and so on globally, uh, for this con- concern. Um, and the Christians, although they some do suffer, most, most Christians just kind of, dare I say, are ang- Anglicans or Methodists and so on, and don't really um, espouse these views that would trigger, prevent interest anyway. I would probably suggest. I think, but yes, I think that's uh, <laughs> that it is remarkably selective in, in that way. Mm. And by the way, it doesn't mean that we have to accept the 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 the, 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 the socially conservative yeah. views of religions. It is just that there is a fascinating, very important and unresolved tensions tension between within the Equalities Act two thousand and ten. The Equalities Act. Uh, protects liberties, but including the liberty to, to practice religion. Mm. A, and so that creates all kinds of contradictions. Yeah. Now, I'm not, and I think we have to have a more of a mature national conversation about how to deal with that. But that, going, returning to the conversation which you show of a young woman being interrogated by a prevent officer yeah. about her religious beliefs, mm. that is a... In, it, it is the state intruding itself on an a, in an area which is no business of the state? Right. No, I, I, not I, unless it becomes a, a law and order issue, you know, a public order issue. It might do, but it's no business of the state to tell them how they should believe in God. Right. Uh, absolutely. Now, I, I was going to ask you, uh, and I'm not now going to ask you about these various front organisations that have been funded by the government that are Muslim organisations set up. Uh, some of them have been exposed and you can read about them here, um, that they are known to be front organisations. Now, they're not real grassroots Muslim groups um, that they, they have been set up by the Home Office uh, and pretending to be grassroots organizations some of them have been exposed but one of them um uh, publicly so this is no longer denied uh i, I forget what it's called you can, you can still see it it's called woke woke is us or something is some that you I, mentioned i deal with I, I i can't remember the all the exact details of the yeah what, what, what the big point i'm trying to do here we name we name some of the magazines the sort of structures the way in which it works in this in this book is that several one of the treasures, one of the wonderful things, and something which is celebrated by all conservatives, I'm writing this from a conservative perspective, uh, and except for neoconservatives and except for sort of market conservatives of an extreme kind, is civil society, which is independent, first of all, of the market, the market can't go near it, and secondly, of the state, the state can't Mm. can't shape civil societies. To its, to its own way of thinking. Mm. This is, a, this is again, is a deep-rooted conservative idea, Burkean conservative. Let, let people, get, we, we really love institutions. We love the organisations, like whether it's the Salvation Army or the 
Women's Institute, or and the, and the state always always trying to muscle in on these organisations. We need to preserve them. And what the state is doing at the moment is creating a series of what look to me like fake civil society organisations. On the one hand, at the other hand, refusing to deal with genuine civil society organisations, but in the Muslim world, Muslim Council of Britain is one of them. Which it, for such, which it won't tolerate because it hold view, holds views which uh, the state doesn't like. Yeah, on, on Palestine, for example, it, it doesn't hold. Uh, it doesn't have approved views on. on I, I don't know. The the the, we, the, the, um, the, uh, the I'd like. We need to. Know, and I. Well, it doesn't really matter what the views are. It's it's not the state's business to police opinion. Right. Right, and the policing of opinion is is the problem with the uh, prevent strategy. Right. So we're moving more towards perhaps a more American model. Sorry? I mean, we're perhaps now moving towards in Britain towards a more American, uh, a more American understanding of citizenship, where mm. you kind of all you you leave your religious kind of distinctness behind. You kind of pull in a common American definition of citizenship. Whereas your your Birking vision is that the the, the civil society. Uh, has is given a space where people can have their religious uh, identities and practices as long as they're not obviously breaking the law. Um, but the American model seems to uh, be the one that's coming in now, where, where you're expected to give up these distinctiveness in, in for the sake of a a common uh, American identity or British. Yeah, identity, it's, it's, right? I think it, a lot of the thinking comes from America. Although I th I'd say that we maybe we're in moving now towards the model which was completely complete opposite of the way we historically the british way of doing things which is the french way yes yes so if you look if you look at what macron has been recently doing mm. under pressure from the far right in france which is to really create um, a, t a tax of the society and closing down going back to, to the stage of closing down Muslim organisations and licensing mosques and imams, yes. um, and saying that you can practice Islam, but it's only in, in, as a, in a entirely private way. Yes. That is what is happening in France, and I think we are moving quite quickly in that direction. Here, I was very shocked actually when uh, Macron announced a series of intolerant measures ahead of the recent elections there and he got praised for it by um leading conservative um very very senior oh, in the uk no he did i i remember that yes he, he did and there's an appalling case of an imam in the eastern part of france i forget exactly where uh who um in a kutba in, in a, a friday sermon uh quoted from the quran and the hadith um about uh, gender men and women um and and it was reported to the local regional governor or whatever and he was um not only uh prohibited by the french state from preaching again he was actually deported from france back to his uh, country of origin which is somewhere uh in africa i forget exactly where extraordinary and i actually looked up the passages i thought well goodness grief well what has this imam been saying and i looked up the passages which are well known i think it's surah 31 verse 30 or something verse 31 and hadith and they're, they're, okay, they're socially conservative, uh, as we mentioned, but they're not advocating. They're not advocating violence. They're not advocating any kind of egregious behaviour at all. It's simply expressing an understanding of gender and roles, which are probably shared by some of the older members of the Conservative Party in Britain, and uh, probably many evangelicals in, in America. Uh, and, and yet, this guy was actually physically uh, silenced by the state and physically deported from the country. Uh, and and this, uh, it's, this has happened like a couple of weeks ago, you know, and, and I've seen the guy uh, on, on YouTube and he conducts himself, he's an African, conducts himself with great dignity and moderation and is not calling for vengeance on France. He just says, I was just doing my job as an imam, preaching the word of God to, to the congregation, a very a measured response, dignified response. So I was impressed with that. He didn't go uh, advocate uh, any retribution. I dare that. say that there are a number of Catholic, I'm not a, uh, priests who say make comparable remarks in France from the pulpit, um, which, uh, and I dare say they don't get deported. 
No. Um, but on this point, I'm glad you mentioned Macron and, and France, because that was really my, my last perhaps, question to you. I'm conscious of the time and, and, and your valuable time, and I appreciate you being on the channel to talk about your book. But um, it is the situation in, in Europe. Uh, th there is a view, and I think it's probably right, that uh, even though Macron won, Le Pen uh, scored her highest ever electoral success in terms of percentage of votes, 46 percent or something. It's an extraordinary figure. And she succeeded in bringing her far right agenda into the mainstream, which Macron, to some extent, accepted and, and stood upon himself as an alleged centrist politician. But the point is this, that some people think, and I think that there's something to this, we're on a trajectory now in Europe, continental Europe anyway, this is not really a British question at the moment, where the populist nationalist right are in the ascendancy, even in France. And there's still a chance that she may win in a subsequent presidential election, of course. And we see this in places like Belgium and, uh, and, and, and obviously Hungary and others. Belgium apparently has now more far right MPs than ever before as a proportion of the overall number of members of parliament. So we're seeing uh, the argument is we're seeing this movement, momentum, this trajectory towards a, an increasing right-wing populist, anti-Muslim political movement in many countries, uh, but Hungary, Poland, Austria, France, obviously, Belgium and others. Is it your sense then that we are, that is the future and, and that things are looking pessimistic for Muslims in Europe in general? And they're slightly different from the UK, which I think has a different kind of dynamic from what you're saying. But even there, I think you, you, might, you might see a common pattern there. Well, what are your thoughts on that, do you think? I do agree with this. I mean, let's also celebrate the diversity, you know, the, the, the Muslim, success of the Muslim community in Britain. There are all sorts of wonderful stories of people who've done incredible things, um, you know, and, uh, and, uh, and so I don't want to be too negative, but there's no question that there's, it, the, 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 there is a growing narrative promoted in the popular press and by politicians just witness the French elections or what's happening in Hungary, uh, that the, uh, which is that it's immigrants generally, but perhaps especially Muslim immigrants, um, present a, a demographic and a cultural uh, threat to the West. Um, you know, the great replacement theory as advocated by that um, French sort of pseudo philosopher, um, has its advocates in this country, um, and uh, and then you look overseas. And I mean, Mr. Johnson, the British Prime Minister, went to India, which mm. when the terrible things are happening now, mm. uh, and which quite authoritative people are saying is in a pre-genocidal situation against the two hundred million Muslims in India, uh, and yet Mr. Johnson didn't mention he didn't. Anything. Right. Didn't see anything, by the way, uh, it, it was I was just stunned. He went there, shook hands, had photographs taken, said very nice things, and didn't say anything about what's going on there. I was I and then when the, uh, in two thousand and seventeen when the I think I regarded uh, it, it, it was very close to being a genocide happened to the, the, the Rohingya Muslims in in Burma or Myanmar. The um, Mr. Johnson was Foreign Secretary, and he actually the his spoke his spokes his spokesman is relevant. It defended um, the Myanmar government while the raping, the burning, the shooting uh, was going on, and um, uh, so it's there is a lack of the sensibility about the threat. To, uh, to 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 Muslims, not just in the West, but uh, around the world, and it's, it's very serious. There've been two, you know, Srebrenica and uh, the events in Rakhine Province five years ago. There have been two genocides yeah. in the last twenty five years against Muslims, and and, and you better realize it that, that this is actually Europe we're talking about. Genocides in Europe. We're thinking the last genocide was surely the Holocaust, and of course that was terrible. And uh, but but there's actually been subsequent. Genocides. Um, in Europe, yeah, but in Europe, in Srebrenica, yeah, where of course the mayor of Srebrenica is. Uh, when I last went there, was a, a genocide denied. It hadn't happened, mm. uh, and um, you know, there's, it's a very unstable situation where Srebrenica is now 
you know, it worked in a way. You know, you, 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 you it was obvious that they got rid of the, the Muslim population largely from the area. So it was now back into, it was under control by the, by um, the people who committed the crimes. It's, it's, mm-hmm. it's very, it's not like, I mean, if you go today, great, you know, the, America, the, the, the German people have fully acknowledged the terrible things they did in the, in, in the, you know, in the, in the, in the fight, in the war. And you go to Auschwitz, it's properly recognized, it's taught in schools, the, the collective guilt has been, it's very, you know, it's, they, have un, they have come to, they, they have admitted that, but they, they are not, that is not happening in, in, in Bosnia at the moment. And this is a dangerous thing, because if, if it isn't admitted, it, it can happen again. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, that's a, a pessimistic uh, note. Um, I think we might conclude it there. Um, and I, I actually uh, do recommend uh, this book, uh, Peter Aborn, The Fate of Abraham, Why the West is Wrong About Islam. Just to briefly uh, go over some of the contents uh, in the contents page, because it's a very wide ranging book, historically and politically. Um, part one talks about the United States and Islam, its historical relationship with Islam. It talks about Muslim slaves. Fascinating subject because uh, many of the earliest people who went to America were actually Muslims um, but with Columbus, but Muslim slaves. Um, and then um, it talks about Islam and the U.S. as a global superpower, uh, the impact of 9-11, and the assault on Islam is a chapter on Donald Trump um, on Islam. And then section two or part two, we have Britain and, and Islam. He goes right back to Bede and uh, Elizabeth I, the Ottomans, uh, the first Muslim colonies, uh, and then up to date uh, with this things on Churchill uh, and Islam and Churchill and India's Muslims. Very harrowing story that. And then on to France and Islam in part three talking about France as a colonial power. Of course, it had many Muslims living within its colonies, and that that has many tragic aspects. The civil war in Algeria being one of the most terrible stories in modern history, I think. And then part four, as we have seen, the enemy within. We're back to Britain here, the Cold War on on Islam and the parallels with the McCarthy era when communists, alleged communists, you know, have you been or were you ever a communist? You know, uh, are you or have you ever been an Islamist? (laughs) Uh, The echoes there are very, very clear. And Peter brings out the parallels, I think, between that era and this era in the demonization of dissent, if one call it that. Uh, Passages here on... Policy exchange, we've not touched on this. There's so much we've not touched on. We can't touch on the, this program will go on for hours. But policy exchange is a neoconservative think tank and their absolutely crucial role in defining British Muslims and British Islam. And this is an ongoing um, think tank, uh, very, very important. Do look, do look it up and learn about who these people are and that they're, well, we'll go into that now. The Conservative Party of British Islam is a chapter on that. The Trojan Horse Affair, we've very briefly touched on that and the false narrative about alleged Muslim grooming gangs, a terrible story that's still ongoing in some ways. Um, And also at the very end, there's an interesting timeline, um, which chronicles obviously the uh, the whole history, the relationship between the West and Islam. So very wide ranging historical, political book uh, written by an eminent journalist. So um, I will link to this work in the description below. Um, it's just published literally days ago, a couple of weeks ago, I think. So, three days ago. Three days First ago. Day it was How privileged are we are to have you on Blogging Theology to talk about it? And I'm sure you'll be on many. I hope you go on Newsnight. I hope you go on all the main channels uh, on British <laughs> Fox <laughs> News. I hope Fox News have you on. Because they've had, dare I mention his name in the same breath as yours, Douglas Murray. Uh, he, uh, he has been on um, uh, all over the place. I just published his book. Um, which is not entirely unrelated to your book. And I'm... Uh, I don't think I, we agree I, about much. <laughs> no, I, indeed. <laughs> um, he, he, he embodies in many ways uh, the kind of neocon outlook that you chronicle in your book. But um, sorry, just in conclusion, there, is there anything you'd like, some, some words you'd like to say in conclusion, Peter? Yeah, just simply, uh, thank you. I really enjoyed talking to you. Thank you very much for listening and engaging. It was real fun and um, I think very important. And so thank you. Well, that, thank you, uh, Peter. And I, I, I wish you um, 
continued success in your, in your writing uh, career, and particularly with this book, The Fate of Abraham, Why the West is Wrong About Islam. Thank you very much. Until next time. Thank you.